Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this special edition of Leadership in Politics with Dr. Abraham. I am very excited, honored, and delighted. Excited because we're going to share with you the latest trend in HR and reinventing the HR in the 21st century. Honored because the ones who's going to share that with us are none other than the father of our modern HR, Dr. Dave Aldrich, guru of HR, Mr. Norm Smallwood, and the entrepreneur of the year, Mr. Alan Todd. And delighted because we have 100 people with us, expected 100 people participants, so we have a full house. Plus, we have about several hundred people hopefully on the live stream. Organization is made up of groups, teams, and individuals. We call those human capital. Also, in the structural design of organization, we have something called departments, whether accounting, finance, marketing, HR. And this conversation deals with HR and its impact on the human capital. So I welcome, I welcome you all. I welcome Dr. Dave. Dr. Dave, welcome. And nice to see you again. Wonderful to see you, Dr. Abraham. I, uh, I can't imagine what a thrill and privilege it is to, to talk with you again and uh, to see you and to uh, share some ideas. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. Mr. Norm. You have been a co-author with many of the books Dr. Dave has written. Both of you are co-author in leadership management and, of course, HR. So welcome. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's exciting to be here and to participate with uh, such a, a, a diverse group of people from across the world. So what a great opportunity for us. Thank you. Most welcome. Alan, welcome. Yes, thank you, Dr. Abraham. Thrilled to be here and... Uh, you know, anytime I can be uh, in in the company of Dave and Norm and uh, and sharing that stage with you is a uh, time that I am deeply grateful for. So thank you. I'm honored to have all of you. Dr. Dave, let's go to you and ask you the first question. As a father of our modern HR, and rightly so, before we explore the organization guidance system, which is the new trend in reinventing HR in the 21st century, can you take us into a journey of HR of the past since the start, where we were before, and why it is important to reinvent HR now? You know, everybody, uh, everybody loves to hate HR. Uh, there was an article in the British press this week of a senior business leader saying, I don't have any HR in my company. I don't need them. And by the way, it's created a flurry of activity the last 24 hours because people say, well, that's weird. I work in HR in your company. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a strange thing because I think legacy HR, is, uh, legacy HR is about people. And I think decades ago, before any of us were even born, people were simply a resource or an asset, like a table or a chair. And so you treat people with disrespect, like you might a chair or a, or a piece of furniture. And out of that grew industrial relations, unions grew up to protect the employees, to make sure they were treated with dignity. That began to evolve where the human resource dealing with people as an asset, not just a, a, a commodity, uh, it grew. And so it was the personnel function where we have terms and conditions of work and practices. And then it began to say, you know, the way we treat our people has an impact on our business success. And so the human resource function began to say, it's not just about people as an asset, it, they're a resource that we can invest in. And in fact, they're the most valuable resource in a company. And so the human resource field is constantly reinventing itself to say, how do we identify the knowledge and skills of our people so that we are successful in our marketplace? And we have continued that legacy. Um, We've been saying HR used to be administrative services, terms and conditions of work. It was then functional excellence, best practice in staffing and training and compensation. Strategic HR, which says, let's get the people and organization to deliver strategy. And we believe with the work Norm and I especially have done that it's, we call it outside in HR, mm -hmm. that the way we treat our people has an impact on customers, on investors, on community. And so we see this evolution of HR that is continually reinventing itself. Uh, the reinvention is not done. It's an ongoing process. And you'll see today some of the, I think, the most exciting reinventions of HR and overall human capital that have gone on in the field. But that's, that's a very quick history. Excellent. So HR now, is, is it in a stagnation stage now? Well, that's why we have to reinvent it? 
I hope not. I hope we reinvent from a position of strength. If you Good. wait until you're stagnated, uh, you're probably out of date. I hope reinvention is it's kind of like continuous continuous process. You, you don't want to wait till you fail to create a new product because by the time you fail and create a new product, somebody's probably cannibalized your product. So I think in HR, we constantly are reinventing. Um, one of the things I'll just give a concrete data uh, we've been involved with the University of Michigan and the RBL group for 30 years about competencies for HR people. What should HR people know and do? We have data from 120,000 people now. Every four to five years, the competencies are 30 to 40 percent different. I see. Wow. I mean, that's a continuous learning process. We're just finishing the study, the eighth round. And I think we're, last round, we discovered some cool stuff. This round, I think we're going to discover 30 to 40, maybe it's 40% or 50, but you got to keep evolving. Uh, if you're an HR person listening to this, look at your training programs, look at your staffing system. Is it 15 to 20% different this year than it was two years ago? If not, good it's luck. Time. It's time. Yeah. It's time. So it's, a, it's very essential. Before we come back to you and we start sharing the new model, the organization guidance system, which I know you're going to share the slides with us. Let me go to Norm, Mr. Norm. You have co-authored with Dave over 35 or 30 books, HR books, leadership and business books, management books. Why? Actually, we've, we've co-authored about nine together. I think eight or nine together. But nine, I but wish you, I, I could take how many books stealing do you have? my ideas for the other 30. Okay. Um, I steal Norm's ideas a lot. <laughs> Um, yeah. So no, about eight, about nine for me, nine or 10 books. Why organization guidance system now? What changed for us to reinvent HR? In other words, what is wrong with the current HR system? The same question. Are we in the stagnation stage of HR? You know, I, I it's, it's such a great question. And I think uh, one of the things that y y we're, we're hearing a lot of right now is that we're in the age of HR, right? So so HR is with COVID and all the various crises that have occurred has, has really disrupted the workplace. So the opportunity for HR has never been greater. And along with that opportunity comes, you know, we need new ways of thinking and new ways of, uh, of, of approaching the workplace. And in, the, in, in all of the books that Dave and I have co-authored together, the theme has been uh, around this notion of uh, results-based. And most of the, the, the thinking in HR today has been about uh, benchmarking. And, and so we're gonna, we, we, we really are challenging this idea of benchmarking. And, and so instead of benchmarking, we're saying, how do we accelerate the business outcomes, the financial, the strategic, the customer, the employee outcomes, how do we accelerate those through investments in, in people? And so, so that's, the, that's the shift in thinking that we're going to be looking at. And it's been a journey that, uh, that Dave and I and now Alan have, uh, have been on for the last, uh, you know, for a long time, right? We, this isn't new, but technology allows us the ability to, to do things that we've never been able to do before with this and, and really drive a, a new paradigm other than benchmarking that, uh, that we think is incredibly exciting. It's wonderful. Nice to hear that. Alan, let me go to you before we have Dr. Dave share the slides and really delve into the OGS. So we have questions. I have questions prepared for you, but I'm going to ask you question three first, awaiting the presentation, and then I'll, I'll go back to number one. What is the purpose or role of, of the HR department as you are proposing under the organization guidance system or OGS? Well, I'll, uh, I, I'll begin to answer that question by saying, um, and I often, I'll, I'll quote Dave. So this is, this is Dave's leadership in the world, which is the number one thing they can give. And Dave, I'm probably going to steal your thunder because you're going to say it in five minutes. But the number one thing that HR can give, this, this is Dave and his research, is an organization that wins in the marketplace. So now when you say to me, how do you apply that to OGS? Here's how. Here's how I interpret that, right? So we think that there are that that HR leaders have an opportunity to start to build a culture around data-driven, evidence-based guidance mm -hmm. for their HR practices. And the way they do that is they invite their 
senior leaders in and make them the champions of the change, right? And the HR leader with OGS can act as the catalyst, right? And drive to a new place, but you're bringing the leaders in and making them part of the diagnosis and part of the prescription. And so we do, and the whole system is built on that. So it's really helping HR leaders as part of the formula for driving that formula for the winning organization to engage the leadership team, to bring them into the fold, to make them part of the solution, to create a data-driven evidence-based approach that creates buy-in. And it's that buy-in that creates the long-term sustainability of the right solutions. And it's about getting on a pathway to using data to inform what you do and how you do it. And that's everything we're focused on is bringing that sort of idea to life through data and intelligent systems. It's wonderful. So we're going to Im involve the organization, employees, and customers, especially when you, Dr. Dave, when you look from the outside in. So you bring customer in. But here you're saying in the new system and model, which you're going to tell us about, you're telling the employee, meaning HR professional, is going to bring all these together and make it happen. Go ahead and introduce us kindly to the new model. You bet. Let me share some slides. Uh, you're welcome. We'll get copies of these to you if you'd like. Uh, and uh, you're welcome to see them. You can see versions of them in different places. I'll share my screen and uh, some slides. You know, it's really uh, risky. Uh, somebody said, tell me about the organization guidance system. It was a podcast. And about four minutes later, he said, you've told me enough. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I remember when I was doing my dissertation decades ago before some of you were born, one of the things nobody wanted to do is tell me about your research because you get so excited about it that the world narrows. Um, by the way, this is more interesting than my dissertation. My dissertation was a numerical taxonomy, uh, which nobody cared about or knew what it was. Let me take you for about 12 minutes through some slides and I'll stop and Alan and Norm will interject on messages I've missed. Uh, so this is a conversation, and then uh, Dr. Abraham will help us work through. So you got to start with the changing context. Somebody just put in the chat room, the change with COVID-19 is going to be more than 40%. I think that's probably true. I think we're seeing a pace of change that's amazing. Content is the king or the queen. It's what you do. The context is the kingdom in which you do it. Well, 2008 and 9 was the financial crisis because of debt and people had to manage that financial crisis. They had to overcome personal and corporate debt. Look at the context today. And I just picked a couple of pictures. Uh, we've got a global pandemic. We've got social injustice. We've got natural disasters. We've got political uncertainty. And what's amazing is it's not tied to one country. It's not tied to one geography. This is literally global. The challenges we face, 40% of countries are flashpoints. Uh, political unrest in the United States is huge, but it's true also in Britain. It's true in Nigeria. We face enormous challenges, and we could spend the whole session talking about that. But what we want to focus on is how do I in HR or a business leader respond? So I just made a list what have you heard about in the last six or eight weeks? How am I going to respond to all of this stuff going on? Boy, we could have a test. Which company has the most of the, has heard these from either webinars like we've done, a TED Talk, a LinkedIn, a consulting firm. Let's just, let me just highlight a couple of them. Let's do digital reinvention, digital everything. Let's become more agile. Agile seems to, you know, if you go into a business leader today and say, I want to be agile, they'll hug you. They don't know what it means, but I want to be agile. Mm -hmm. Let's do more working at home. Let's show empathy. And, and so you nod your head and smile at people. Let's do team building. Let's change our culture. Let's be socially responsible. By the way, I look at that. And as I go through those 30 or 40 initiatives, I'm starting to feel overwhelmed. I'm starting to feel overwhelmed. And if you're not feeling overwhelmed in your company, send us an email and we'll send you some programs that will overwhelm you. Um, cause we've got solutions in search of problems. We've got people doing stuff, a leadership academy, a transformation, purpose-driven organization. Let me tell you the question we now come to. Are your investments in all of these initiatives, people and organization, giving you the results you care about? You know, that's a pretty simple question. Look at all the things I could do. 
which ones will have the most impact. Alan talked about a, an intelligent design system. Do I have data? How do I know in this uh, chart? You know, if I had to pick three of those squares or circles, which ones would I pick? Why? And it's not which is the popular book today. Do I have a methodology? And what we have found is that companies, and if you're like most companies, you're spending one to 2% of your revenue on those initiatives. But you don't know for sure where to spend it. Would you like to have an analytic system that helps you know where to invest in those initiatives? That's it. It's a simple question. We just did a survey. Norm and I did a, a call yesterday and we said, how much confidence do you have, one to 10, on it, where you should invest in those initiatives? And Norm, I don't remember. The average was about six? six per, 60 percent. Yeah, six out of 10. percent. You know, if I have 60% confidence that the gift I got my wife for her birthday this year was going to be meaningful, I would probably not be married for 45 years. I need to have better than 60% confidence. Uh, we think we can help you with that. That's the agenda in a nutshell. Norm or Alan, do you want to add anything to just that? That's the agenda. That's the simple question. Yeah, I mean, I just had lunch with... Uh, Congratulations. With, uh, with, yeah, yeah, and I'll tell you all about my lunch. I had a chef salad. Um, so, so I just had I just had lunch with a CEO of the local company here. That this the CEO has been um, really sort of a good friend for a long time. Has really done a great job. And I was explaining to him what the organization guidance system was, and he said, "Gee, you're not describing it right. What you've got is an accelerator." You've got an accelerator on what I should do to drive business outcomes that I want. And, uh, and he said, so you should call this the accelerator. And, <laughs> and, but, it's, but it's like it's so exciting to when, when once somebody understands what this is and how this works, this is probably the most exciting thing that I've worked on in my career. And I've had a long career. So, Alan, a comment, and then I'll, I'll take you through kind of what it is. Yeah, well, my comment um, is just to re is uh, I'll, I'll double underscore what what the point you made, Dave and Norm. I really liked how you called it an accelerator, but it's really it's like the hyper focus machine. You, there are so many different uh, HR organization leadership uh, and talent initiatives, right? When we looked at all the cells and the framework, you're trying to model a universe with hundreds of choices. And you're supposed to figure out as a senior leader, what's the one or two things we should do to breathe life into our strategies to deliver the results that we hope. And I think that the most exciting thing for me is that we're starting to narrow down to a few set of things and we're starting to use data to get more intelligence about that. Here's what you should do. That's it. Dr. Dave, question two. You, one of your articles, you said organizational guidance system helps leaders personalize and tailor their human capital investment. How so? Explain to us through the slides we're gonna cover. Let me explain through the slides. Um, for those of us in the human capital area, either a business leader, HR learning, wherever you are, we've seen an evolution of analytics. Norm talked about benchmarking. You get a report, notice the normal distribution down there. Where am I against others? Where's my benchmark? Once you find out your benchmark, you go try to copy somebody. You try to get their best practice. So you say, wow, what does Amazon do? What does Google do? What does Unilever do? Then you go look at predictive analytics. What are some interventions? And we go get data. You know what? All of those are useful, but they're not focused. Benchmarking tells me how I'm doing. Best practice tells me how somebody else is doing. Predictive analytics gives me a sense of data looking backward. What I want to do is look forward to guidance. I want to know what I should do. And our field has been littered with best practices. Let's go get a book that talks about the great companies to study. No, I want to know guidance about which company I should study. And so the guidance logic is really simple at a, at a high level. Career guidance. I don't want to know what Dr. Abe should do for his career. I want to know what I should do for my career because I don't have his gifts. Look behind him. You see, a, you see an Emmy or an Oscar. I mean, mm. I don't have an Oscar. And Dr. Abe does. He's got guidance that helps him in his career. He's a mentor to students. 
retirement. We're going to retire in different ways. We want guidance, mm -hmm. investing, computers. Guidance starts with results. What are the results my company needs to achieve? Not the activity, but the results. What do we need to do with our employees? As Dr. Abraham said, you got to have employees who have well-being, commitment, productivity. What are we trying to get with our strategy? We want to be differentiated. We want to succeed in a new marketplace, often today through technology, digital. We want to succeed with customers. We want to have a net promoter score, a value proposition. We want to succeed financially. And we want to build good social citizenship. All five of those are critical. You can't have guidance until you know where you're shooting. A guided missile starts by saying, I'm going to the moon or I'm going to Mars. I've got to have a direction. That's the direction, the North Star, whatever you want to call it. Then we ask the question, where could we in the human resource area or human capital area invest? And there are literally hundreds of ideas. Our view is they fall into four categories. One, we can invest in talent. I'm going to show my fingers. That's people. Mm -hmm. What can I do with the human capital, the people? We can also invest in organization. That's my fist, the team, the ability of the team to work well. We can invest in leadership, the combination, or we can invest in the human resource department itself. That's it. There's four pathways where we could invest to get those outcomes. Then we put together a very simple logic. The human capital, all those four areas, is generally 1% to 2% of revenue. Look at the five columns. You've got the employee column, are we getting better employee results? The strategy column, the customer column, financial and social citizenship. Look at the four pathways, talent, leadership in purple, organization in brown, HR in aqua. We then have identified, and it's not perfect, we're still building it, 37 initiatives across those four pathways. Now you've got a grid of five columns by 37. That's 185 cells. Let me ask you the question. In those 185 cells, do you know where your organization should invest next year? What's the outcome you're trying to create? Horizontal, or vertical. What's the column you're trying to invest in? Can you go to your business leader, or if you're a business leader, can your HR person come to you and say, you know, we're going to spend some amount of money, 1% to 2% of our revenue. Which are these cells we should invest in? My final slide is exciting, and I won't be able to interpret it. We've been on this journey now for about 15 months. We've done an, and, and what we've laid out, it looks pretty simple. It is not. We've had to come up with the measures of those 37 rows. We've had to track them. We've measured. We've remeasured. We've remeasured. I think we're on round three or four of our surveys. We've had to correlate them with some very unique statistics and algorithms we've just made up, um, hopefully done well, so that we have some confidence in what we found. We just did a summary of the data with 1,000 companies, about 2,000 people. Here's the results. This, is the, this was done a week ago, so you're one of the first audiences to see it. Notice at a high level, you've got five columns, those are outcomes, and 35 or 36 rows. We've added a 37 since we did this data. 180 cells. The dark green are the cells where you should invest. And then the lighter green, the uh, whatever color that is, yellow, are the secondary. So let me just tell you what this says for the whole data set. This is pretty exciting. I want to invest in my talent. Got it. There's nine areas in talent. Look at the dark greens. I better be acquiring talent. I better be doing communication. Of all the talent things I could do, employee engagement, departing employees, retaining employees, developing employees, the two activities for the whole sample of 1,000 companies, we have more to go, and we hope every one of you will join this. Those are the places to invest. Leadership. Oh, we got to have better leadership. Everybody agrees. What have I got to do? Look at that data in purple. I've got to build a business case. A company came to us a few months ago and said, let's invest in developing better leaders and invest in leaders as developing leaders. Let's go spend money on a new program. We did this work for them. It said, don't spend money on developing leaders until you have a good business case. 
Look at the organizational, Brown. Where should we focus? Boy, you hear people talking about, let's go be innovative. Let's be accountable. Let's do information. You know what? Those are not the organizational investments that matter the most. The one that matters the most is strategic clarity. HR, and again, I'm highlighting this. This is so cool to me because I've tried to come up with ideas. Now we know which ideas to focus on. Let's go redesign my HR department. Uh, no, not so fast. Look at the HR rows. Let's build relationships. Here's what our data says. If you have good relationships with HR people inside the HR department and between the HR people and business leaders, the way you structure your department won't matter as much. You'll have more success. That's pretty cool. So I'm going to go to Alan and Norm if they have comments on Dr. Abraham. We'll go back to you with questions. Definitely, but definitely. Alan or Norm, any comments? I've just covered. Very, that's the end of our slides. So uh, we're out of slides. Um, any comments on any of that, Norm, or reflection? Well, we, we got a question here from uh, Shell to the panelists, which was a uh, great thought-provoking session. Uh, really, the question is, what culture and leadership have you seen that enables the success as a foundation? And I think the, at least I'd uh, love to hear Alan and Dave's answer to this as well, but I think that the, the, the thing that I've seen that's the most impactful is just to get you know, a group of 20 or so cross-functional leaders in your company to try it out. Just go to rbl.ai. It's free. Do one of the pathways, leadership or talent, or do all of them. But uh, just to start and get a report and see what, it, see what it's uh, telling you and, and get the dialogue and the discussion going. Excellent. Alan, do you want to add anything to it? Yeah. I, the, the only thing I would add is this gives, this is really an opportunity for uh, HR folks to start to champion a data-driven approach, an evidence-based approach to making some of these really strategic choices. And I've seen a couple of times people are saying, you've got to align to strategy. Well, if you do the, if you do the pathway and multi-rate, you're engaging your leaders who are bringing their thinking, their strategic thinking about strategy. So by some, in some regards, the, the strategy is embedded into the choices they make when they fill out the pathway. So if you can get 20 senior leaders in Norm's example and be the champion of pulling that together, I mean, you're really getting a, a, a pretty incredible strategic data-driven uh, approach to what should we do and, and bringing them, they're involved in, in that diagnosis and prescription. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Norm. And Dr. Dave, thank you for introducing the OGS to us and to our audience. And I'm honored that you chose us or chose me to present OGS to the audience. And I thank you for sharing this new theory. It's a forward thinking. It's an innovation. It's a new thought process. OGS, Organization Guidance System, is a prescriptive model. It's a call to business leaders for a guided action. Anything else you'd like to add? I'm going to think about this discussion. Two things. One, Dr. Abraham, thank you. We know you have a lot of people you talk to. We know your time is so precious with your students in school at Redlands. And uh, I encourage folks to follow you and to track your work. Everything I've seen you do has just been professionally done and exceptional, which is why you have one of those Oscars behind you. Uh, and I don't. I have rocks. You rock, sir. You rock. The other thing that's going to touch me a little bit is why did I get so emotional when I talked about emotion? And it's not directly about the guidance system, but I really do care about this profession. I think what we as HR professionals can give our business leaders is something that creates organizations that win. I'm going to go where Alan was. The best thing I can give a business leader and my employees is a successful organization. And if the guidance system does that, people who are struggling emotionally for whatever reason will find work as a place that they can excel, that their gifts and their skills can be fulfilled. Let us in HR take care of our people so that they take care of our customers. Let us guide you in that effort. I think it's a noble journey. And I feel that. I mean, I, I got to re I'll be thinking about that all night. Why was I so emotional when I talked about that? And I guess it's because I just got off the phone with an incredible business leader who's just emotionally drained. Let us find ways to help you get your emotions back. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. Such an honor. I bid you good well. And we'll see you again. Audience, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. It's an honor.